Well, welcome everyone um, to this webinar. We are happy to have this webinar um, courtesy Jalinga and the Mohammed bin Rashid School of Government. But just a few words from Rafi before we, we begin. Thank you, Professor. My name is Rafik from Jalinga Studios, and I'm very happy that I'm today in uh, Mohammed bin Rashid School of Government, and I'm happy to see that uh, you are using Jalinga Studios uh, to create your webinars and to conduct your uh, your messages. So we wish you all the best in uh, your upcoming webinar and uh, we hope to uh, see more usage of Jalinga Studios in Mohammed Barash School of Government and in the UAE. Thank you, Raf. Thank you. All, all the, best. the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so today we are so delighted to have this um, webinar entitled Innovative Approaches to Education for Creating Future Leaders. I am Emmanuel Azad Munissa, a professor here at the Mohammed bin Rashid School of Government here in Dubai, and it gives us great pleasure to be here with you. I have Dr. Raquel Warner, who is your Managing Director of Ray Consultants, as well as a non-resident fellow with the Mohammed bin Rashid School of Government. Welcome, Dr. Raquel. Thank you so much, Professor Emmanuel. Okay, so without further ado, we hope we both will be quite interactive with this. Please feel free. Um, from time to time, I will be looking at the chat box. So if you do have questions, you know, throw those 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 questions in the chat box, and we'll be we'll be delighted to to answer these along the way. Um, should uh, should it be also contributing to our discussions as well? Feel free as well. So without further ado, we would like to um, start off in going into the future a bit, in terms of the future leaders of edu as educators as ourselves, whether we are in higher education, whether we are in uh, middle school, or even in the primary and the kindergarten era at large. Uh, maybe perhaps, Dr. Raquel, you can give us some, some light on what we mean by future leaders in education. Thank you very much, Professor Emmanuel. Now, when we talk about future leaders, I think we have this sense of the crisis of leadership that we're actually in. And there is this ongoing desire for us to train our current um, young people or current students or current learners in order that they will have those skills that they'll be able to use to address the VUCA issues that we have in our world. We talk about the world being volatile, being uncertain, the world being so complex and the ambiguity around which um, we operate. And so when we talk of future leaders, we're talking about people who are able to assume these positions, people who are going to be able to make consequential decisions that will affect society at large. And so I think when we look at companies today and their corporate strategies and the cultures that they, they have, we're looking at leaders who are able to go into those contexts sometime in the future and be able to perhaps change a lot of the culture and to perhaps advance those organizations into the 21st century that we're currently in. So it's quite, thanks Dr. Raquel for this um, insights with respect to, you know, this world that we live in, the VUCA, the volatile area, especially we all were witnesses to the latest pandemic, uh, COVID-19, sorry to bring this up, but, you know, we all as educators had to go through this. I remember receiving that notice on the 3rd of March 2020 to say that we were going to go online and what what did this mean for us as educators so overnight we have to convert all of our materials into into an online friendly uh, manner uh, familiarize ourselves with the various teaching tools online and so forth it was quite it was quite um, a, a daunting process for some of us and as educators especially um, those that has the little ones as well, you know, how do you keep the little ones in the room? So, you know, um, this, this is really something very uncertain that we were not really prepared for in 2020. But as time go along, we have been very much um, adaptive in terms of, you know, leading in, 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 in having innovation within the education streams itself. 
Now, it's really important for us as we, as, as Raquel has um, identified, you know, it's so important as future leaders in education for redefining the education so that we can help shape the future, not only for ourselves, but for the future generations. Perhaps Dr. Raquel, you can give us some bit more insights on this. Right, now part of the work that I do at Ray Consultants is research into leadership and management, research into education, because I kind of span those two industries with, with my work. And several large-scale industry studies, along with my own research, indicate that more than 50% of senior leaders believe that the talent development efforts that are being done to graduate leaders into the world of work is insufficient. Many um, senior leadership believe that education is actually failing um, industries because when they get students, they're actually not quite ready. They don't have the skill set required for leadership. They haven't adequately built their critical thinking skills or their organizational capabilities, which are in demand skill for leaders. And so what we've found is that there is a need for traditional education programs to somehow up their game, as we say. If we're going to prepare future leaders, this innovative approach to education is going to be absolutely necessary. And it's one of the challenges, in fact, for the education sector to rise to this need. Companies are actively seeking employees who can move into leadership, but these employees must have the communicative skills, they must have the interpretive skills, they must have those effective skills and perceptual skills, which will help them to be able to move away from the kind of episodic, linear and discipline focused approach that we often have to leadership today. And what most higher education institutions are required to do is to adopt this innovative teaching approach. Um, because what we're finding is that billions of dollars, billions of dollars, I believe there are some statistic um, from Forbes, which says that 10% of the nearly $20 billion that are annually spent on training and development it's not being realized when people actually enter the world of work. And so this is a huge loss. And so thinking of innovative teaching strategies is what's going to help us to overcome this loss. Well, thanks, Raquel. I mean, you know, this, this statistics is quite alarming for us. And it really is an eye opener for us as, as educators in, the, in, in this field. Now, just so we'll step back a little bit in terms of the traditional um, education as we would know it. Many of us here in the room, very much uh, uh, appreciative of our traditional education. I'm not um, in no way trying to say, you know, it's, it's not been as, as effective and innovative in, in, the, in the times where we can remember. When we talk about traditional, it was really the textbooks. It's the knowledge coming from the professors. It's the interaction in just into the classroom itself where the lecturers will, or the teachers as we would, we, would, we would call them as well, are the ones who would, be, who would be the ones leading knowledge and imparting this knowledge to their students as a whole. So it was traditionally a one-way approach to some extent, um, if we can recall. Now, when we talk about innovation when it, in, in education, we, 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 we want to look into moving towards more um, digital um, uh, approaches, tools that we use into the classroom, but not only digital. Digital is not the only um, uh, recipe for innovation in education. It's the redesigning of curriculum and so forth. And we will be unpacking on this in much more details shortly. Now, a bit on the innovation, innovative approaches that we have identified earlier, um, as, as, as um, we, we, we spoke about for future leaders as a whole, you know, one of the first elements as we would talk about is in terms of experiential learning. Now, what do we mean by this? This really focuses on, you know, those hands-on experiences that we, we allow for students to actively participate through activities, through experiments, through real case scenarios, through real case applications as a whole to get a deeper understanding. 
I myself know um, from, from experience having certain number of education along my journey, the real learning took place in the workplace. So bringing this workplace scenarios into the classroom, having the students to unpack these various real, real problems as we would like to call them and have them to come up with the various solutions and to understand how to deal with this in a realistic scenario. Of course, being informed with your theories, your frameworks, your conceptual um, understanding of the various topics and so forth. So this is, is one of those um, innovations in terms of the experiential, experiential learning aspect. We also want it to be very much adaptive learning where the use of technology is, 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 coming, to, is coming to part. How do we interact with our students? So sometimes we may want to have quizzes or let's say open-ended questions using various applications through digital platform in real time itself. And we will on face on a couple of these examples shortly. A third element is looking at your collaborative learning. Now, if we can, if we can recall, um, you know, in, in our traditional sense, it, it, it always tended to be a, a, a teacher-led approach to the students and just one-way dialogue to some extent. Now, in, in when we talk about collaborative learning, we really want to encourage students to work together in groups, work in teams, work on trying to problem solve issues because this is the reality in the workplace, in, 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 in our various places of work and so forth. So this is quite critical for us to keep in mind when we talk about innovative approaches. A fourth example is in terms of gamification and simulation aspect where this really incorporates game-like activities, scenarios that you bring into the classroom and its teachings as a whole, where it really increases your engagement. You have, as we know, our learners are various types of learners. We have active learners, we have many types of learners where we can engage them in the learning aspect. We also, in this, in this particular gamification and simulation aspect, we also um, move away from that traditional approach and we encourage more participation, more engagement, not only between the peers themselves, but also between the teachers and, and the students as a whole. Another, another area is the flipped learning aspect where it really involves the reversal role of the students so that they can, they can best inform the knowledge that they, have, um, that they have gained, but to get those foundations at outside of the classroom, to learn the basics outside of the classroom, so at their home, at their, at their places of residence and so forth. So this is quite critical. And then when they come into the classroom, they can actually jump into the into the action so that they can unpack these various understandings and so forth. We also have the inquiry based learning where it's really focused on the curiosity and the exploration of, in, in terms of the minds of, of the students themselves where the students can you know they can explore and investigate further in how to unpack those problems and how to unpack this black box of various issues and to come up with um, scenario plannings and coming up with those various solutions as a as a team you know doing those collaborative approaches as a whole and then we also last but not least the project based learning which we will we will jump into uh, into much more details with some examples but this really involves the students getting their hands in the mud getting it all dirty trying to to understand the real problems that we are being faced in the workplaces and how to come up with the best solutions possible at large so it's it really helps us to to encapsulate these various approaches as a whole um, coming on and it really gives us some of these benefits which Dr. Raquel will will take us through um, now. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel. Now, something that I'd just like to add about the different approaches to innovative learning is this idea of personalization of learning. And it perhaps links back also to the difference between traditional education and innovative approaches to learning. 
personalization of learning is something that's absolutely critical if we're going to meet students at their points of needs. And as teachers, as educators, we have to be painfully aware that students learn, as, as Dr. Emmanuel said before, at a different pace, they learn in different ways. And the 21st century classroom has to be very, very cognizant of that. And these approaches that were mentioned before, the flipped learning, the collaborative learning, gamification and so on, are opportunities for learning to be personalized. And so with the use of whatever technological tools and also with a growth mindset, educators are able to bring students into that environment so that we can differentiate learning for them and it doesn't matter what level they're at whether they're at postgraduate or kindergarten but these um, approaches to learning that we're labeling as innovative learning approach allows a teacher to be able to allow it allows an educator to be able to personalize the learning and to make it more adaptive more creative more innovative and ultimately more effective for students so when we talk about the benefits of now shifting to these innovative um, approaches, one of the first things we see is that it encourages active learning. What we're saying is that innovative learning approaches give students the wheel. Students are in the driving seat. They are determining the pace at which they learn. They're not so much de determining the content and the theories, but the way they absorb those information, they're actively involved. Involved. And the immediacy of the knowledge that they're learning also makes it very active. So it's interactive, it's engaging, and it forces them to actually participate. Now, when we think of the, 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 the critical thinking skills that students develop when they're being asked questions. For example, inquiry-based learning requires that students start off with a point of question. And so that shifts the whole dynamic in the class where it's not the teacher who's asking the question anymore. It's not the educator who's the sage on the stage. The students themselves are driving the learning by the kinds of questions that they're asking. So those benefits, um, those are two of the benefits so far, I think, there are a couple other benefits um, when we look at um, innovative learning. And the, the, the reality of it is that innovative learning, um, when, when we talk about um, the, the, the benefits, we perhaps won't unpack all of them today, but the importance of problem solving is one of the leadership dynamic that we tend to talk about at our dinner tables. You know, when we see how leaders today are behaving, we say, well, they can't solve problems, they can't find solutions. So problem solving is a critical skill that's required for leadership. And by using innovative learning approaches, we're able to get students to actually solve problems, real world problems in authentic contexts. Um, we talk about building better, well, improving student retention. Um, when we look at the statistics of students who start universities or who students who start their, their graduate programs and do not complete for one reason or the other, often when you do research among these students, they will tell you they couldn't manage, it wasn't engaging enough, they couldn't balance work and life, and so they drop out. One of the things that we are proposing is that if we had an innovative approach, which was more flexible to students' needs and more personalized, we would see higher retention rates. So that would be one of the benefits. Then we're talking about building better relationships. Collaborative learning is about building relationships. And so we, we understand how important networks are. We understand how important social capital is for future leaders. If we start giving students those skills in the context of or higher education institutions or our high schools or universities, we're going to be able to see students building their social capital because they understand how to network, how to build relationships with their teachers, with their peers, and they'll take this into the world of work. When we think of the other benefits in, in terms of creating an effective environment that encourages exploration and collaboration, if a student feels that the world is their oyster, 
if a student feels that they're in a learning environment which is safe and they can inquire and they can they can experiment because they learn from their failures this is an added benefit and so when we look at um, innovative learning it enhances students adaptability it enhances their resilience they're able to make mistakes and learn from them they're able to change the way they do things their approach to learning their approach to studying there's a heightened metacognition that happens when students find themselves in an innovative learning environment we talked before of the benefit of personalization of learning but Finally, and perhaps most critically, is this concept of cross-cultural learning. Or students today, or graduates today, find themselves in a hyper-diverse environment. How do they deal with that? And so the innovative learning environment allows students to learn cross-cultures. It takes learning outside of the geographic space because of the internet, because they can tap into resources that are in multiple geographic boundaries. And so our future leaders who end up in these innovative learning spaces are far more capable to handle diversity. They understand what equity looks like. They understand what inclusion looks like. And so it's then easier for them perhaps to set this culture up when they start practicing to be leaders in the real world. So those are perhaps a few, you might be able to think of others, but I just want you to realize that if we shift to this innovative learning approaches, we're actually setting our students up to be able to function in a world where leaders, the, the demand on leaders is quite high. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks Raquel. And you know, just to, to add to the personal um, <clears throat> learning aspect as well, you know, it's part, the, the, the journey here is not uh, faculty-led or teacher-led in itself. It's also to bring the students to that, that ownership of their own education as well. And I know earlier we were having a discussion, Raquel, about this. And, you know, it's really critical for the students to, 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 to own. If they own that, 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 um, that their role as, as, as being educated, you know this this and you they bring this in part and parcel of their everyday learning as 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 we would like to say you know and we personalize it once it is within themselves you know once we once they take that ownership this also helps drives the 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 um the students engagement and encouragement and and collaboration with their peers and and others that are surrounding them but thanks for highlighting these benefits raquel so before um, we now will be going into an international case study and then we'll also look at a local case study as well. But from the international bit, we will let's hear from um, uh, the, uh, a world winner in terms of the Teachers Award, the Global Teachers Award in 2019, and the case from Kenya. I am Brother Peter Mukayatabichi. I am the winner of the Global Teacher Prize 2019. I teach in a rural school uh, located in a remote uh, area uh, in Pwani village, Lift Valley part of Kenya in Africa. I teach science and uh, mathematics. My students go through a number of challenges, even teachers, and including uh, studying in a school that, that is um, uh, located in a, a resource constrained environment. Because we don't have um, facilities for teaching and for the students to be able to learn, um, so we work with what is available to really assist the students to be able to, to learn. I mentor students to come up with the projects simple projects by improvising the local affair materials um, and uh, be able to come up with those uh, uh, something that can really solve uh, challenges that the, the local communities are facing. It assists them to really learn the scientific skills of, you know, of collecting data, of recording, analyzing, of how to like make a presentation, communication skills, so they are able to develop those skills. You find that 
uh, uh, the, the, their level of discipline increases because that enables them to work together and they develop respect and the, the kind of respect their teachers and you find that they are even doing well even academically. We have seen students who are able to uh, change their community and uh, kind of spread the same message even back to their families. Once you make a student to believe that they have the potential, they'll be able to, uh, their service team will go up and they'll be able to work hard academically in all the fields and that's why we have been really busy, really, uh, kind of getting students joining colleges and universities. As a teacher, I believe that we have the power to really make learning become uh, interesting and interactive because I believe that every student has every child as a gift and it only requires someone to be near them for them to shine. Okay, so here we have this case study, international case study from Kenya. I know uh, Dr. Raquel would like to add some points on this. Thank you so much. Now, what I found interesting with that case and why we decided to include it is that sometimes we have this misperception that when we talk about innovation, we're talking about technology. And it is very clear from Brother Peter's um, case that this is not so. Innovation is not synonymous with technology. It's not synonymous with digitalization. All right. What innovative education is all about is the change of attitude, the change of approach that puts students' engagement as a necessary driver for learning and for information transfer in the real world. You'll notice that he said the students were identifying problems in their communities and solving them. You notice he said they were making change, they were having an impact. That's what innovative education looks like. It's about effecting change where you are. It's not about digitalization. And so if we never used another computer again, we would, not, we would still not have an excuse to say we couldn't innovate in our classrooms. So it's a challenge. It actually is a challenge for people in resource-rich environments sometimes. It's so comfortable, it's so easy. But I challenge educators who are on this call today to think that it does not have to be in a resource-rich environment. It can be done because we change our approach to understanding how students learn. And we give students that confidence that they're able to make change in their community, and we facilitate that. Thanks. Thanks for highlighting these points. Um, so I will give a brief um, a case study, local case study from the Mohammed bin Rashid School of Government, where project-based learning is one of those important um, drivers as, as, as we, that we use as assessment in our master degree program here at the School of Government. We are a School of Government, more or less a public policy institute, where we offer uh, master degrees in innovation management, public administration, public policy, thereabout. Our students are working individuals, all working individuals, full-time employees who are studying in the evening times and on weekends with us here. So a couple of years ago, I think, um, a couple of years back, we got project-based learning uh, uh, um, as one of those initiatives which we had benchmarked, practiced it, uh, we, we more or less ironed out the issues before we officially launched it. What do we mean by this project-based learning, more or less? We look at the project-based learning in itself as one of those one of those key areas where where we looked at the just now some te some technical issues. So we looked at um, the project based learning in two main areas. We look at it as immersion in terms of full immersion or your case studies immersion or partial immersion. We also looked at it in terms of two um, real world scenarios being live, being um, just in presence at the moment in time, real time itself, as well as having a proxy real world problem in itself. So what we did, we have four quadrants, which we can see quadrant one, and I will give some example shortly as well. 
where we take our students across across seas, not only locally, to visit local authorities, um, a public sector, private sector, and third sector organizations to understand their various workings within the field of public administration, innovation management, public policy, governance as a whole. We also take them abroad. So whether we take them to, so for instance, for innovation, we took our students to uh, South Korea, to Japan, to China, to uh, Germany, and most recently to uh, Silicon Valley in the US. Um, for instance, in global governance, we take the students to Geneva in Switzerland, where it's the hub of the United Nations, where they, they go and they visit various entities as a whole. And in, in all cases where students go abroad, they get that real, real case scenario in terms of understanding, you know, how, how various sectors work and how they work across the board as well. So it gives them that, that, uh, that, that um, full immersion in terms of um, these, these study abroad programs. And I know within the college system, within the primary schools, the secondary schools, they also do these study abroad um, programs. So it really gives those students those full immersion as a whole. Not forgetting your um, co-ops and having your internships, of course. Um, with those w that are studying in, the, in for IB, for instance, for your bachelor's and your master's degree and so forth, internships really gives these students these um, full immersion aspect. It gives them those real world and live um, issues that they can see at front. We also have in, under the, the umbrella of the uh, full immersion, we also have the real world proxy examples where we have we, we partner with companies, for instance, I'll give an example like Kareem, um, where th th they wanted to expand their services, not just doing driving or transportation of passengers, but also trying to, they ask our students how we can be a bit more innovative. And this is pre-COVID, where one of the assignment, one of the solution was to transport medication. Now, this came into, into full effect during COVID-19 here in the UAE, where Kareem was using one of those, um, was using it as one of their solutions. And this was where the students, our students at the School of Government were able to brainstorm and unpack these various issues. And they came up with a number of solutions. So you have, you know, um, transportation for, for food and so forth, for, for Amazon deliveries and so forth. And, and it goes on and on. So they were able to unpack this. Now, with them unpacking these problems or trying to problem solve these issues, these real issues, we've also tied this up with the assessment. This was part of the assessment. So it was a project that they would have to work on, um, understand the issue, understand the, the, the agenda from the organization, tr and try to understand the various options and present these options to the company. Now, when we say present to the company, this was this was the various directors, of course, with within the f the specific field that they are responding to in that um, in in response in response to the problem that they are addressing, they would present these solutions to 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 this group of persons, not only us as professors and their colleagues, but the um but the the the, the company itself to get to get those um those insights to get the the. The, the various feedback and recommendations, um, acceptances of the, the solutions as well, and adaptations and so forth. So it really gives the students this, this real um, experience in, in unpacking these particular problems. We've, apart from assignments, we've had also students you responding to problem, policy problems and policy issues and so forth in through their through their project based learning through public policy briefs as well as their dissertations so their final projects that they would have had to respond to or, or complete at the end of the day the thesis as some of us may know it as so they also problem solve using it in their dissertations similarly in the partial um, immerse immersement itself similar approach going in trying to understand the problem as well. It may not be that full hands-on experience at the company um, visiting regularly, having regular interviews and meetings with the company officials themselves, but also unpacking, uh, unpacking of these uh, solutions to problem solve the scenarios as a whole. 
again using it in your dissertations and projects as a whole and the last quadrant which really works looks at your simulations so students have worked on patents for example we have also had students working on case studies so yes it's all well and good to be fully immersed in these various areas whether it's your live real world problems responding to your live real world problems or proxy problems but also it gives them that 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 opportunity to document these case studies in itself so that it can be used again and again in the classroom where you have local content and us as educators we tend to to use case studies that are a bit ancient a bit 10 years, 20 years old, 30 years old, in the contemporary time we live in today, it's very, it's very, dif it's very different as we have lived 20 years ago, 30 years back and so forth. So responding to those various problems would be quite dif different. So having local cases, having contemporary cases, up-to-date cases, this also helps helps um, help students to understand the literature a bit more, to make it much more applied as opposed to just only being theoretical. So this is a summary in terms of our project-based learning example here at the School of Government. And recently um, in the news, we the Mohammed bin Rashid School of Government was listed as one of the first universities to embrace this type of pedagogy in in the in the context of the UE of course within the masters um, postgraduate um, context itself where you know critical um, thinking skills and future skills in itself as we know have been identified by the World Economic Forum you know we have those 10 skills that we need to really focus on digital is one of them but being quite innovative in our teaching approaches so that we have our graduates being being ready for the real world being being having those employability skill sets as a whole because one of the one of the one of the main comments we get from it that says the one stop or um, one stop shop as a solution but it helps to help you know to add in terms of making our graduates much more um, ready to jump into the workforce as a whole now we will jump into the barriers of innovation in terms of innovative um, in, um, education approaches in itself where Dr. Raquel, you can um, right. share some light on this for us. Right, I'm, I'm glad you touched on the importance of assessment as part of this um, whole shift in, in our paradigm toward um, innovative education because there are always barriers and in education, we tend to describe education as being quite monolithic. It's a very slow moving monolith and change comes sometimes very, very slowly. And some of the barriers to those changes are the same barriers that we have to education, to innovative education approach. And one of the first ones I must confess is teacher related. Teachers can sometimes lack the ownership or the understanding of innovation. And so the change may not be in line with their existing values or they may think it's just more work that we'll have to do. And so that negative attitude can actually hinder the implementation of innovative teaching strategies. And so the solution to mitigating that is involving teachers at the very beginning in this change that we're going to make in our institutions, allowing teachers to realize that this is not something they need to fear. It's not going to increase their administrative load in any way. In fact, it could actually lighten their admin load. So the, 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 the teachers can sometimes get very emotionally bound up in what they do and they feel all day, oh, here's just another change again. But we have to manage that change properly and that's perhaps a topic for another webinar. Now, the second barrier is system related. Sometimes poor communication, there's a lack of mutual trust between those who want to implement the change and those who are on the front line. So if there are those systemic um, barriers within institutions for the change to be embedded, then of course we're going to have some challenges. Um, sometimes the people who are trying to um, advance these innovative teaching approach, they put too much emphasis on the detail. And so people tend to get bogged down with what they have and what they don't have. As I said before, it's not about resources. You can be in a resource-strapped environment and you can still employ innovative teaching approaches. 
And so sometimes it's also because systemically there is not enough professional development for teachers. And so it went, once we begin to change those systemic issues where we're training teachers, they are upskilled, they understand the direction in which we're taking them and the reason why we're doing this, then quite likely we'll get the buy-in and there will be that systemic change. And then the final barrier can often be institutional. It can be school related. And this can be where there's a lack of a supportive culture. And often in schools, there's this tension between the admin and the academics. There's a tension between the management and the people who are actually doing the work. And so if there are inadequate resources, if there's inadequate communication, there, there can be a stumbling block to actually implementing these innovative teaching approaches. So in our, in our attempt to implement these approaches, it's gonna be really critical for us to look at these possible barriers and in advance think of how we can best mitigate them. Which brings us to some of the exciting solutions that, um, <clears throat> that we propose, you know, making sure we have that ecosystem, having that classroom ready to embrace innovation from a systematic point of view, from an institutional point of view, and as well as from an individual, both from the student perspective as well as the, the, the education, the educator, him or herself as, as a whole. And also making sure the environment is very much equipped. Here at the School of Government, this, this room that we are in right now, we, we call it the green room. It's um, we, we, we partnered with Jalinga, who has had put, had um, put this room together for us, so that we can be we, we can we can extend our arms beyond the classroom, but also into the into the web, into the world itself, and make it a bit more in, interactive and so forth. So it's really critical for us. Am I no? And also, I'm by no means least promoting a company. Okay, just. Just disclaimer. <laughs> um, so you know, just making sure we have um, the teaching environment and the learning environment as a whole to have those 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 modern um, softwares and programs and even rooms ready for for embracing um, the various styles of, of innovation in education as a whole. Raquel, would you like to add anything yeah. on these points? I I just want to say, Professor Emmanuel, that the key to a good environment is a, the culture of the ecosystem. And the culture needs to be supported by both teaching and learning environment for, inf for innovation. Learning is influenced by teaching and the learning environment. And so once we can get the right balance with these things, what we realize is that by engaging external stakeholders, we talked about the triple helix engagement model some years ago, where there's this network between government institution and industry. We have to revisit that as one of the solutions to creating a more innovative environment. Our teachers do not have all the skills, so we're gonna have to bring people into our classrooms. We're gonna have to take students out of our classrooms into industry. So how do we make that triple helix model work between the private and the public sector stakeholders? And we have to be able to leverage our available networks for innovation in education. Very well. Thank you. Thank you for the, for elaborating on this. So <clears throat> we've also so we've 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 um on face on many of the discussions earlier where we would like to call it the four re's as as Raquel and I were were brainstorming earlier. So one of it is rethinking the purpose of education. It's very critical for us to really rethink this. You know what is our purpose in education? We are imparting knowledge to to uh, to our students. You know we really need to understand what is our main purpose. Also to redesign the curricula as a self or the syllabi in itself, the module handbooks or the the curriculum. There's various subjects and so forth. Also reducing the inertia among the regulators. Many times then this can be one of those obstacles in itself, but we really need to understand and to reduce this inertia in itself. And finally, to reimagine the professional development for educators. And Raquel pointed on this earlier, you know, as educators, um, we may not have that full or ongoing um, um, let's say, process of having that professional development for us. And especially in innovation, if you want to have innovative 
um, mindsets in education in itself to impart the knowledge we really need to have those trainings and developments to bring us up and to make sure we have those skill sets and competencies to deliver innovative education as a whole now the future trends and opportunities over to you Raquel Right. So we're, we're looking at the world in which we live and what we're trying to do in, in, in innovative um, education is to optimize what we have. What is it that we have in our hand that we're able to use now? And I think there is the, the future trends and opportunities exists because of the advancements that we're seeing in ed tech. There are so many resources that are being developed that we're able to incorporate in our classrooms. We're seeing a lot of opportunities for cross-cultural learning, as I said, taking learning into diverse contexts, bringing diversity within the classroom. We're seeing opportunities for global collaboration. And in, in business, we're seeing it. We're seeing it in education. It just needs to be amplified and it needs to be optimized. And then there's this idea of lifelong learning. I don't want to sound cliched, but this is perhaps the key to it. This is the silver bullet. If we all have this concept, this notion of the importance of lifelong learning, then we're going to want to pass that on. We're not going to be resistant to learning new things or doing things in a new way. And so with these as future trends that we're seeing in the field of education and in the industry, we can leverage these to um, somehow make the introduction or somehow make the transition into innovative educational approaches more seamless across different educational spaces. And we also have inspiring future leaders through the, the um, this exercise that we've done today, today's webinar, we would like to, to sum up in terms of the various takeaways. So we, we've seen that incorporating project-based learning methods is quite critical for us. This helps us to encourage creativity and critical thinking as a whole. We've also seen fostering collaboration as well as teamwork, teamwork uh, mechanisms is quite critical. We've also seen provide this provides hands-on experience as well as providing those real world um, applications to problems that we are being faced. And then also not forgetting integrating technology and your making sure we have those digital literacy skills um, increased over time. We also have seen, and maybe Raquel, if you would like to, to, to sum up the, the, um, the ending here. Right. I just want to say that innovative approaches to teaching in our classrooms and to learning in higher education spaces and other other educational contexts are essential. It's, it's not an optional extra that we're looking at. We're moving into an era where our education has to change if we're going to be educating future leaders. And so it's, it's not an option. It's something that we have to approach with a bit of urgency. And what we've tried to do here this afternoon is just to suggest to you some of those mechanisms and some of those approaches that if you're unfamiliar with or even if you're already very familiar with, you can perhaps create a professional development course for yourself so you can bring others along that journey with you. There is an urgency and I think we have to respond in a way that is impactful for students if we're going to remain relevant as educators that's one of our biggest challenges how do we remain relevant in this digital era how do we remain relevant in an era where knowledge is ubiquitous and so we have to really step back and look at how we can implement some of these approaches to put the learners in the driver's seat and to simply shadow them and to guide them into those leadership roles that they will ultimately be taking. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so <clears throat> in, in also concluding, adding a bit to inspiring our future leaders through innovative uh, education in itself, it helps us to cultivate leadership and its quality through empathy, through resilience, through adaptability, as well as offering those mentorship and guidance from the various experienced uh, professionals. Also not forgetting em emphasizing ethical 
as well as the decision making and social responsibility as a whole and creating a supportive and inclusive learning environment for, 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 for both parties, for your educators as well as your learners and not forgetting that we have different types of learners in itself. And then finally, empowering the students to really take that initiative and make it personal, be the owner of their own education as a whole, in order to make a positive change in, in their communities. So at this time, we would like to, to wish you Ramadan Mubarak, as well as thank the organizers, the Mohammed bin Rashid School of Government, as well as Jalinga, for supporting us on this initiative. And we are open for questions and answers, or any comments um, for a bit, or maybe for a few few minutes there about if we do have some questions and answers. Do we have any questions and answers? Okay, well on this note, thank you for your participation and we wish you all the best. Masalam. <laughs>